Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the latest episode of If Data Could Talk. I am your host, Andy Cockgrew, technical evangelist at Tableau. It's great to be with you all. Today, we have Julia Lane. Uh, she's the author of Democratizing Data. Uh, this book is a manifesto for change, uh, change about how governments, or the US government specifically, manages data and the culture around all that data management. Uh, and let's just say that for all the good stuff that is being done, it's a creaky old system that might need a little or a large amount of reform. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Julia's going to explain some of the ideas in her book based on her experience of 25 years in the federal statistical system uh, and government. Uh, Julia is founder of the Coleridge Initiative and a professor at New York University. So with that, I'm, we're going to talk about why I enjoyed the book and what Julia hopes to do to change the world. Julia, welcome to the show. How are you today? Lovely to be here. I'm uh, feeling very good indeed. Hope you are Very as good. Well. Good. Excellent. So the book, um, we have a problem with access to data in our democracy. I guess that is the one sentence summary. Can you explain, you know, what, what is the current problem that, that, that you're seeing? Well, I think... Um, so first of all, I'm going to hold up the book so that you 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 know where to go and get it. Um, the uh, as I said, as you said, I've been spending um, most of my career working with data in the in the federal government and uh, both as a user and as a producer. And the and the the challenge that we have is that data, in many ways, are the foundation of our democratic system. Uh, the counting of the population is in the very opening part of the constitution, the enumeration of the population, because if you uh, are counted, then you count. Uh, it affects your vote, it, it affects your voting powers, it affects how money is distributed, it affects where school support, um, it, it, uh, high quality data uh, go throughout every activity that we do. And the challenge I think that we face is that having high quality data for the public is incredibly important. We shouldn't have it rationed where rich people or rich businesses can have access to high quality data, which gives them a, a more advantage in terms of figuring out how resources get allocated when poor people don't. So mm -hmm. high quality, I'm going to start with the premise that high quality public data is essential to a democracy. We see this and we, that now we're seeing threats to it. In the United States, the CDC health data has been a mess. We've had to turn to the private sector. For the population, the census, that's been under threat. For counting unemployment and jobs, that's been fragmented and very difficult to capture, uh, or even to weathering climate data has been under threat. Yeah. And, and uh, so I'm very concerned about the uh, effects on how we operate as a society. Yeah, you, you describe um, the challenges of ancient structures. Uh, I think you use the word a Frankenstein's monster of decentralized and centralized elements, right? So it's it's not, we kind of got here, I guess, not not through some deliberate, intent to be in this situation right you know there's a history of you know as you say the census census and gdp uh and so you know how do you think how did we get to this situation even if the intent of counting gdp was a, was a good thing in the in the past you know what, what's sort of happened well i think it's it's normal atrophy right so um the the current system and i talk about it in the book it was really generated almost 100 years ago so under the great, in the Great Depression, we didn't know how to count economic activity. We couldn't describe it. Uh, we, weren't, we didn't have official measures of unemployment. And so in the 1930s, um, the measurement of GDP was developed by an outside researcher, Simon Kuznets, um, and they figured out, here's how we can uh, describe What's going on with the economy? I mean, think about what was happening in the late 1920s and the early 1930s. Herbert Hoover had to figure out what was happening to the economy by looking at freight loadings on, on trains. Um, and that's not a particularly good aggregate. So 
right, so we went in and we figured out what to do. And we set up the machinery to count jobs, to count unemployment, to count the production of economic activity. And very, very good people have been involved in making sure those trains run on time for almost a century. And so the whole infrastructure has been built around those foundations. Those, um, and then, of course, the foundations for World War II. How do you get material? How do you figure out how much agricultural manufacturing we have? And it still reflects that. Mm. So, um, of course, now we have a completely different world. We've got a tsunami of data. We don't just have to go out and capture surveys. There's administrative data. There's transaction data. There's our digital footprint. And yet the, our system is set up for 100 years old. So we need really disruptive change. Yeah. Very difficult for a bureaucracy to change direction. I, I, find, I found that section about GDP fascinating because, you know, I grew up in a world where GDP is the measurement of the, a, a nation's success. And, you know, when we look, you know, I'm in the UK and one of the lessons um, that from Brexit in the UK where, where they think, well, why did the politicians misread the nation was that politicians are obsessed with GDP. But you know what? Most people, a 10, 2, 3, 4 percent swing of GDP doesn't change people's day to day existence. Right. It, it, it's completely alien to their lives. And as a system, we kind of miss that picture. So I find that I find that absolutely fascinating. You talk about um, agencies also having to you know, agencies get set up to produce a single number. It's like your 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 agency produces one number. Um, and uh, uh, can you talk about the challenges there? Because I think that's one of you know anybody anybody listening who works in business will know right. about the key performance indicator challenge as well. Yeah, those KPIs will drive you crazy, right? And there's a whole business school literature about what you measure is what you get. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it, your, your point on GDP is obviously a fundamental one, and I do talk about it in the book. Your, Diane Coyle, who is a British academic, has, has written some very, very good material on that as well. The, um, but, you know, a jobs measure has even been more out to lunch, right? Because, it, mm. because it's a survey, it only captures uh, kind of average activities and it's very difficult to capture the outliers. So it completely missed the degrees of inequality. It marginalized populations. So the the huge swath of impact of NAFTA and, um, and uh, the economic change in the Midwest, which, and, and in the rural areas, largely got missed because of the way in which the, um, the, eco the data were collected. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it fundamentally affects how we understand what's going on and our ability to respond to it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so I think you, you've started touching on this. You, you've mentioned private companies, you know, you know, big, big technology, Silicon Valley. They, they, are, they have masses of data, a gazillion different types of metrics, and we all happily give that data away in return for free products, right? So a lot of your identification of the problem is going well hang on there's something happening here it's not happening in the private world it's not happening in the public world so the disruption needs to marry some of those together so wh how, how do we do it well, how do we bring that disruption and creative destruction to government so that's agencies? that's exactly the point i make so um you look at what's happening in the private sector and the biggest companies the fastest growing the dominant companies a company has figured out how to use data effectively. Amazon, right, is eating up the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, they've all figured out how to use data and, uh, and, to, and to target decision making and to make money, right? I mean, that's their job. I'm an economist. That's, that's what they're expected to do. In the public sector, the big data uh, companies, if you like, the big uh, statistical agencies, they're dying. They're not getting any money. And I would argue that the reason is, is that, and I do argue that the reason is, is that they're producing um, information that are not particularly useful in this day and age. And so how do you turn that around? So what the argument that I make is, is we need to figure out how to create measures that have value to people in a timely manner and to the constituencies that are of interest. So what are our big interests now? At the local level, 
Um, you want timely information on what's happening to jobs, what's happening to economic activity, what's happening to health, so that the local agencies can react and respond. So if we can create a new infrastructure that is live, driven by local interests and local demands, and there's now massive amounts of data at the local level, extremely granular. So let's pivot just as 100 years ago, the demand was to produce one single national number. Now let's figure out how we can produce local numbers that are reliable, that are accessible and useful and timely. And that's what the second half of the book is about. Yeah, I think that the local aspect is really interesting. And, uh, you know, you, you just just even in, the, in this year with, with COVID that's happened, you know, at the, right at the start, we just wanted to know at the national level, it's like, well, how's my country doing compared to, you know, Italy, which was sort of weeks ahead of us on this curve. And then and then you saw it's like, well, now it really doesn't matter how many cases there are across the country. I need to know what I do in my postcode or my zip code. Uh, exactly. Um, so you get right. You go into a lot of detail in the book about about that detail, um, which we don't have time to go into now. But can you give so that that summary is 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 some good aspiration? Are, you, are there any specific examples you can give to kind of illustrate a way to to drive that change? Sure. Um, and and I think we're in. I didn't know when I was writing the book <laughs> just how important data would show up turn up to be. Yeah. Let me. Let me give you an example from 100 years ago. So back in 1900, um, the National Weather Service was all centralized in Washington, DC. And they decided and forecast what was going on. So there was a big storm that was coming. They forecast that it was going to hit Florida. And in fact, it hit Galveston, Texas, and 6,000 Americans died. After that, they changed the way in which they collected and disseminated data. So there was there's now local stations that get precipitation and temperature and weather and wind and hurricanes and so on. And so we don't get one national temperature that is produced on the first Friday of every month. We don't get, like the GDP, data on hurricanes that is a quarter late and then revised every a quarter after that. We have very timely information because of the reorganization. So I think the augers here on health and um, uh, climate and information on um, jobs and population, they're such that we should be rethinking the way in which it's done. And there are two ways in which I would do that. One is um, data are already largely collected at the state and local level. You could build partnerships with people in the universities who have the capacity to collect and, and store that data in secure facilities. And then you build uh, training so that people who are working with the data understand how to create measures that have value and that are timely and reliable. Because it's very easy to put data together. It's mm -hmm. not so easy to put high quality data together. And I think mean, let's talk a little bit about 2020. Um, but do you think what's happened, you know, with the, the world and the US, the UK, everywhere has had to spin up quite a lot of new data systems from nothing uh, in response to the virus and with varying degrees of success? Has, has is what you've seen given you cause for optimism uh, or concern or a little bit of both? Well, I'm, I'm very, I'm an optimistic person by nature. So um, I, and I think, you know, as, as wise people say, when something can't keep going on, it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the people have been pointing to problems with the data infrastructure for the past 25 years. I think the, the level of interest and engagement in collecting high quality data, there's new legislation passed in the United States, the uh, Foundations of Evidence-Based Policy Act. So, um, and there's a lot of goodwill in, in rethinking how the data can be uh, can be developed. So we have uh, a couple of models that um, help inspire us. Uh, one is uh, like the national lab system. We can have a Manhattan project to create public data just the way we did uh, the Manhattan project to build a bomb. Let's build something mm -hmm. that is going to be for the public good. And there's um, 
the second piece is in the United States, the Agricultural Extension Program, where um, you build a relationship between universities and government agencies to create new measures, new information uh, in order to respond to the problems that people in the farms had. Now we're dealing with problems that people uh, in the cities and the urban areas have. We can build that same kind of conversation and dialogue. We, and just one other piece, the other reason for optimism is um, we don't need a, a set of high priests at the national level who are the store of all knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. You certainly need high quality, and there is a fundamentally fantastic staff in the federal agencies, high quality statisticians. But now we have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data scientists, and many of them are interested in serving the public good, not just finding out how to get people to click ads on Facebook. And so I think there's a massive uh, capacity to, um, to build new foundations. And that's why I'm optimistic. Well, I, I'm I'm glad you're optimistic. I, I think I think sometimes I can feel a bit pessimistic, Julia. And uh, so I, I I guess one of the challenges I have is um, setting up a data agency is I, I worry is a harder sell because if I go I'm going to self set up an agency to look at climate change or agriculture or education. You know, you're putting people can buy into that investment being at the front end or at the front at the front line of, of the problem you're trying to solve, whereas trying to be like, we're going to, we're going to rebuild the central aspect of government. Um, you're like, well, hang on. Well, how does that impact climate change? Right. It's like, well, I know that answer, you know, that answer, but it's a bit of a harder sell, particular, particularly to people who want small government um, and specific investments. Um, am I wrong? Are you, are, no, you you're, ex no, you're <laughs> exactly right. So in fact, the way in which the United States statistical system was set up was for precisely that reason. So in most other countries, you know, in the UK, they have the Office of National Statistics. In New Zealand, mm -hmm. we have Stats New Zealand. Um, in the US, it's a it's a more of a fragmented system with Bureau of Labor Statistics that does jobs, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, transportation and so on. And um, so it was designed for that, but it kind of got a long way away from being close to the coalface. Mm -hmm. So I think. Um, the way in which you, we should be thinking about it is exactly right. We're focusing on the value. What are you producing that has value to your state and local areas? And really what the data infrastructure should be is thinking about a plumbing, right? So it's a public utility. That's not centrally facing, but it is incentivized to provide high quality feeds so that people can make better decisions. The so that is absolutely critical you've got to create value at the local level and and the utility is what provides the the resource i like i like that utility thinking of it thinking of it as a utility that that gives me optimism because they do invest in all the utilities in this country still and uh, we couldn't we couldn't do without those um I, just that, that there's one that there's one aspect of the, your your uh, proposed ideas that i think will also really resonate with uh, our business users and our business audience here uh, is you talk about the five safes now obviously the, the, you know this is in building trust in data for a federal agency in order to be able to use data but I, I think I found those really applicable to anybody you know, could you can you just give us a bit of background on that yeah so um, first of all the um, the five safes are kind of a framework for which uh, any operation should be set up. So um, the first thing is you, in order to get safe use, you, you first need to start with a safe project. So what does that mean? That is a project that is approved for the mission of the agency. So it is the so that. We are doing this work, not because we're pulling massive amounts of data together in a big brother way, is a very clearly defined purpose. The purpose is to allocate resources better to find jobs for people to create economic growth, whatever that is. So safe project is the starting point, not a boil the ocean activity. It's a starting mm -hmm. point and it's defined and, and narrow in purpose. Then the second point is safe people. That is when you're building a data infrastructure, it's not 
open to um, a 14 year old kid to come in. It is people who are going to contribute to that safe project. So it's data scientists or statisticians or people who have uh, a stake in the production of that data. So they're at the coal face. The third thing is the safe settings. And that's the technology that's so important. So um, we don't need to have standalone computers. We have the, the cyber security in place that can be uh, made available. The fourth is safe data. So you don't want to have names. You don't need to have names or identification numbers and so on floating around. You provide a hash identifier so that, you know, we, we, we don't have Andy's name floating around. You're a 256-digit number that mm -hmm. has been transformed. And then the last thing is when you're, you don't need to have the individual level data floating around. It has to be, before anything is used, you create the KPIs, if you like, from an aggregate, not from the underlying uh, aggregate. So those five safes, safe yep. projects, safe people, safe settings, safe data, safe export, uh, provide you with that framework. That's great. I mean, I, I, I read that and I'm like, well, that, that's excellent for government, but it's excellent, excellent for anybody trying to implement oh, the right. data strategy. Really good. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, in a moment, we'll come on to what you're reading and watching. Um, but before, I guess the last question is, uh, in January 2020, we will have a new administration or, or the US will have a new administration. Um, it's been a pretty difficult four years politically. There's been a lot of volatility. There's a lot of competing priorities. Are you seeing signs uh, that, 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 that uh, Biden and his new administration are going to uh, adopt some of this? Uh, and if not, what would you like to see? Well, I think it's, it's important to note that this whole push on data um, has been growing for a long time across multiple governments. So it, it, the initial commission on evidence-based policy it was a bipartisan commission. It was formed under Obama, but Paul Ryan uh, um, sponsored it, was the lead sponsor in the House. And then the second thing that happened was the federal data strategy came in under the Trump administration. So the, the point that I'm making here is, and I think I, I love this line, which is you can be for more government or less government but everyone is for better government. And so the notion that data is important and foundational to delivering services to people and information to the citizens of the country is foundational. And I don't yeah. think that's a that's not a by that's not a partisan debate. So I'm very optimistic. And if we Good. could get the money to do the Manhattan Project and to do the Moral Act, the Ag Extension Program, I think good heavens, we can uh, say that data and evidence are foundational. Well, I, let's hope so. I think um, that's a great place to take a pause for the main section. Thanks, Julia. Our next section is Julia. What have you been reading, watching or listening to? In this section, we like to find out what our guests would recommend a data-driven audience or any audience uh, to go and have a look at. Um, you know, but what, 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 what's on your mind? What do you think would be of interest? Well, there've been a couple of books. One is, um, you know, it's called The Glory and the Dream by William Manchester, which has been just a fascinating um, look at what happened in the 1920s and the 1930s in the United States. And I strongly recommend it. You know, uh, people get very discouraged in, with this pandemic and the lockdown. And I can just see my father who lived through the Bristol Brits, Blitz and, uh, and the bombing. And he'd be saying, oh, you're soft, right? Because you, you didn't go through anything. Certainly when you read the, uh, the Manchester book, you certainly get a, get, get a sense of good heavens, how different things were in the, in the 1920s. And yeah, 30s. The, 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 I, so I haven't come across that book, but there's a show on BBC Radio 4 in the UK called The Long View. And it's just wonderful. It's been a great introduction to history for me because they go, well, here's a here's a current situation. Um, vaccinations was the last episode. Let's go back 100 years, two, three, four, 500 years and go, you know what? All of this has happened before. Uh, and, and here's the uh, link to the previous uh, previous instance of a similar story. So, yeah, 
that, that and, that, and then the other book I've been reading, and um, you know, I've been very intrigued by the growth of interest in diversity and inclusion and equity. Um, and certainly at New York University, there's been a lot of interest, I think in most universities. So I, um, there's also been a lot of pushback. And so what I've been reading is The Diversity Delusion uh, by Heather McDonald, uh, because I think it's interesting uh, to see what the um, both sides of any story. There's always two sides, and I'm always interested in seeing what, what the other side is thinking. Yeah, that, um, I, I mean, again, I've not come across that. I know that's got a, uh, you know, uh, to anybody who leans to the left, it's got a provocative subtitle. Um, so it, it looks really interesting. And, and again, you know, I, I'd say to anybody, you have to you have to consume information from the other side of your political um, spectrum, because if you don't, you just end up in an echo chamber. Uh, it helps you question your own data sources, helps you question your own opinions, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, challenges your own beliefs. So that sounds pretty interesting. Let us know what you think of that one when you finished it. Um, I, the thing I've been looking at is, well, uh, Julia, do you like crosswords? Well, I do. I'm not very good at them, I'm afraid. So, um, but I imagine you are. Uh, well, I'm, I'm okay. I like doing cryptic crosswords, which is not really the US style crossword, but um, yeah. And do, do you do the crosswords in the US press? Uh, I actually, there's a New York Times spelling bee that I prefer, which is oh, trying to ah, figure out yeah. how many uh, how many words you can make out of a set of letters. And I'm kind of addicted to that. Yeah, I love that. So, I, I, the game Boggle, best game yeah. in the world. But anyway, that, uh, anyway, go play Boggle. That, but that's uh, I wanted to bring attention to a fantastic piece on The Pudding by Michelle McGee. And she's analysed crossword clues and answers for the last um, you know, many, many decades uh, across all the US press. And guess what? It turns out crosswords are too old, too white, and too male. Uh, really interesting analysis, great data storytelling in this piece on just how non-diverse crosswords have been. And you, know, you have to be a person like me to really be able to get into crosswords. And that seems completely and utterly wrong, right? because uh, that's not diverse at all. And then uh, they, they have the example of USA Today, where the editor, whose name I forget, but he's a 27-year-old guy, he came in and said, I'm going to make diversity a key part of uh, this crossword for the future. And again, through the data story, they show, you know, there's complete representation across the board in the crossword clues and answers. Uh, so yeah, I think... So isn't that, isn't that interesting? Because that goes back to the notion of how new techniques and new approaches can generate new data that we mm. never even thought of collecting that, you know, a yes. survey would never mm. get to, right? right. So um, my colleague, Frauke Kreuter, did an ana analysis of um, when you type in professor into Google, prior to a couple of years ago, all that came up was males because the Google algorithm mm. identified professor and then uh, people were pointing this out, so the algorithm changed, and now you see quite a diverse response of images associated with professor. But the here's the point: you didn't, you don't need to go out and do a survey and then get wait two years for the results to come out. You've got all this magic at our fingertips. That, uh, Julia, uh, that, that's the, that's the best place to stop because that is that if when I tell tell my bosses why are you doing gift data talk, I am literally like because data is everywhere. And it affects everything and you can quantify it all and gain insight. So you just, we're going to pull this quote out and I'm just going to send it to my bosses and say, look, that's why we do. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. What a joy right. to talk to you. Yeah. What a great place to finish. So Julia, thank you very much. Uh, do you just want to hold up your book so people can yes, see Yes, we do. Democratizing yeah. our data with MIT Press. So I uh, very much hope that you buy it and yeah. get in touch with me if you've got any questions. Where can we get in touch with you? Uh, you can email me at julia.lane at nyu.edu. So okay. julia.lane at nyu.edu. Very good. Great. And uh, with that, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Do let us know what you think in the comments below. Uh, do you read crosswords? Have you read Julia's book? How do you think we can re-democratize data? Oh, it's all up for a fantastic conversation. With that, have a great day wherever you are, and we will see you next time on If Data Could Talk. Take care. Bye-bye. Lovely. Thank you. Bye-bye.